even right now, we're just going to do something a little bit different. What I want you to do is I want you to just say, speak without singing for a minute your praises. So say, Lord, I love you instead of singing just for a minute. Just begin to worship him just with your, just with your talking. Praise your name, God. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord.
Father, I want to thank you so much that no matter what happens in this world, we do have a strong consolation. We do have a place of refuge. We have you. Father, this world is a it's not an easy place in which to live. But yet your grace is sufficient to help us live in this world. Father, I know that not everybody here has come to the place of fully understanding your will. But Father, we are continuing to press in and believing that we're going to come to that place of knowing all of what you desire. So Father, tonight, we just say, my mind and my heart is open to you, Lord Jesus. For you to minister to me out of your love and your will. Thanks, Father. Thank you so much for this family that we have here in this location, for this wonderful facility where we can come and be together. And wherever people are watching, Father, I just pray the same for them that your will be done. Thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay. You guys have been practicing this part for years. So put it to work. Yay, praise team. Yay. Good job. Good job. Good job. We're blessed, man. I'm telling you. We are blessed. Um, you know, I've seen some of these praise teams and some of these big churches like on YouTube. And man, the talent is there. And, and, and sometimes, you know, they really seem to be worshiping the Lord. But... Man, I'm telling you what, I, I trade worshipers over talent any day of the week. That just, that's just the way it is. And, uh, you know, we're blessed. I mean, we're really blessed. And I thank God for what we have here. Praise God. You know, every now and then I stand here and I tell you things. And you give me that look like, you think I'm lying to you. Well, really, for the most part, I don't. <laughs> That's like, well, what do you know about this fellow over here? Oh, he's basically honest. <laughs> so wait a second. But anyway, I'm going to tell you something, and, and your first reaction is going to be, you're lying. There's no way. This is true. This afternoon, I, I stay here. All afternoon, I, I don't go home. And this afternoon, I do what I very often do, and that is sometimes I'll, I'll go to YouTube and I'll look up certain songs and what have you, and uh, there's certain songs I just like to listen to over and over again. Well, anyway, I'm listening to this one song, and you know how on the right-hand side of the screen, a whole bunch of other songs are listed? And I see this one <laughs> song, and I think, you've got to be kidding me. This cannot be a song. So I waited until the one I was listening to got over. And then I clicked on it, and I'm listening. Sure enough, it's a song. Now, here's the title, and I am not making this up. I'm going to hire a wino to decorate our home. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> that, I'm going to hire a wino to decorate our home. <laughs> That is the title of the song. You know, and, and you think some of the things I share are crazy. That is, somebody actually wrote that song. Now, I know, you, don't you dare get your phone out, right? And de <laughs> well, the sermon can't be as good as this song. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> going to hire a wino to decorate our home. That is just plain weird. So let's get into the sermon and unweird our brains here. All right, please turn to Proverbs chapter 18. 
Last week, last Sunday night, began teaching on a subject we've covered in the past, but it's very critical that we cover it again because this really is one of those it'll make you or break you subjects, and it has to do with confession, what we speak. Years ago, you know, when I was growing up in church, I didn't understand these principles, and uh, it took a lot of teaching, well, really not a whole lot. What it took was some people showing me in the Word of God in, in a few sermons how important this is. And when you go through Scripture, and we're not going to do this tonight, but um, I have isolated several verses in both Psalms and Proverbs that speak specifically about our confession, about words that, that come forth. And I was really amazed at how much is in there. Well, then you go into other portions of Scripture, you know, where, where God said, you know, speak to those bones. And uh, there is value in what we speak. You know, in, uh, in Isaiah chapter, you don't have to turn to this to stay here in Proverbs 18, but uh, to kind of review a little bit, Isaiah 55, God talks about, you know, when my word goes forth from my mouth, it won't return void. It'll... It'll accomplish what I want it to accomplish. And you see over in Genesis chapter 1, the very foundation for uh, confession, where God said, let there be, and there was. And God said, let the creatures produce after their own kind. You know, and I'm summarizing, you know that. And what he spoke over 6,000 years ago, it's still working today. That confession he made in Genesis chapter 1 is still working today all these years later. And then he says, let's make man in our image and our likeness. And so therefore, we're supposed to be operating like God. We're not going to be God. We're not going to be able to speak, you know, let there be light and create universes and things like that. Beyond that, though, or up to that point, rather, we have the ability to change things with our word, with our confession. And... The hard part is just for us to get a hold of this and believe it. To truly believe that we can change things by virtue of what we speak. Now, granted, if we want to see what God wants, then we need to be speaking what he says. You know, in Romans chapter 4, it talks about how that God calls us things that aren't as though they were. And then we see in Isaiah... God saying, you know, I know the beginning from the end and I can declare what's going to happen and I speak it and so forth. And, and then we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, where it talks about how that we as believers are looking at those, at those things that, that don't exist. We, we're speaking of those things. This is a principle for us. And really, one of the, the challenges to this, or what I, I would say maybe what complicates it so much, is that we are so natural universe oriented that we kind of disconnect ourselves from the realm of the spirit. Well, see, the Bible, this book that we have, it originated in the heart of God. Now, he's a spirit. That means the Bible originated in the realm of the spirit, but then God gave it to people and they wrote it down and in a way that only God knows how this works, his life, his will, all of this about him was transferred into this book. This book right here. This book is life. This book has creative power. God sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. The centurion goes to Jesus and he says, my servant's at home sick. And uh, Jesus says, all right, well, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion says, you don't have to do that. Just say the word. Just say the word. And Jesus says, wait a second. <laughs> You're not even Jewish. And you believe this? And the centurion says, yeah. I mean, I'm a man under authority. And I've got people under authority to me. So I know the power of words. I give a command, it gets done. Your ability to command goes beyond just telling people, go get my horse, go get my shield. 
You speak to things that I can't even see, and they obey you. <laughs> and Jesus, listen, in all the scripture, that one right there got his attention probably more than anything. He says, you know what, I haven't found this kind of faith, not, not even among the Jews. And they're the ones that have the word of God. He says, you know what, your servant's healed, go on home. And uh, sure enough, the servant was healed, you know, as it, you know, from that hour or however it's written. Well, see, that centurion 2,000 years ago understood the power of words more than most born again, filled with the Holy Spirit Christians today. And we're the ones that have the ability to alter the course of history with our words. You say, well, what do you mean by that? All right, think about this. As of right now, now I'm, I'm just going to create a scenario as an example, all right? So, you know, I'm not saying anybody in here has a problem. But as of right now, your physical body is destined for a breakdown because of the, the physical afflictions going on in your body right now. Okay, that is your destiny. But you can change your future with your words. You can change it so that you don't have that destiny. See, that's your body. And you have authority over it. In, um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, it tells us, you know, don't speak rashly. And what that means is you, you've got to watch what you say. You have to, you know, quick to listen and slow to speak. You know, and there's a verse kind of like that in Scripture. And then in Ecclesiastes 8.4, it tells us that the word of a king carries power. Well, we've made, been made kings and priests unto God, and so therefore our words carry power. In uh, Ecclesiastes 12, verses 9 through 11, it talks about how that our words can act like nails to fasten things in place. So when we speak, we're gluing something together. We're nailing something together. We're cementing something in place by virtue of what we speak. This, to the natural mind, is just nuts. Because in the world, people talk about, you know, saying things in your words and so on and so forth. But in the body of Christ, we're at a different level with this. And when you begin to present the potential of Christians when it comes to what we speak, man, some people, they just, you can tell they're, they're zoning out. You can tell that there's disbelief by the look on their face. It's like their eyeballs are demonstrating disbelief. It's like, I hear what you're saying, but yeah, like, you think I'm going to believe this? Well, our confession it's not about trying to get God to act. God's already promised he will act because when we read in the, in the word, he says, okay, look, now I'm going to paraphrase. You pray, I act, okay? So my confession is not trying to get God to act. My confession is related to what God has already said he'll do. So what I'm doing by virtue of my words is I'm creating the path, if you will, for God to operate. Because see, when God created this universe, he gave man authority over the work of his hands. Now, when he did that, it meant that God no longer could work or move arbitrarily in just any situation, however he felt. If he could, nobody right now would be lost. Every single person would be born again. There'd be no sickness. Everybody'd be healed. There'd be no wars. He'd shut them down. But see, he's given us authority in this world, the work of his hands. So therefore, I mean, if God gets frustrated, this would be a great source of frustration for him. He, his hands are tied. He's waiting for us to do our part with our confession so he can move with his power. Now, if we don't do it, what's going to happen? 
You know, in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it talks about how that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Well, when we're confessing the word of God, what we're doing is we are enforcing the law of the spirit of life. Now, in Proverbs chapter 18, in verse 20, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, this is the word of God, and he can't lie. These two verses right here, as much or more than any other verse in the Bible, should convince us we had better watch what we say. We better watch how we talk about ourselves. We better watch what we speak over our business, over our country, over our governmental leaders and so forth. We better watch what we say. Because he's telling you right here, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So do you love death or do you love life? Well, I love life, Brother Martin. Yeah, well, is your confession lined up with life? Or is it lined up with death? You know, the example about, you know, I gave the, the creed, the, you know, the made-up illustration about, well, you know, the affliction in your body and you're destined for a physical breakdown and all this kind of stuff. And uh, how that, you know, you can change that. But if you keep speaking the present condition of your body, why do you think anything's going to help? How many times have you heard people say something like, well, you know, ooh, I tell you what, it just hurt, it just hurt. And so I went to the doctor and, you know, they, they sent me to therapy and they gave me these pills, but nothing helped. How many times have you heard that? How many times have you said that? <laughs> okay, I know that healing comes from God. I know by his stripes we were healed. I know that. But if you go to a doctor and the doctor says, you know, use this salve, take these pills, you know, drink this concoction you know, or whatever, you know, go to the therapy. I mean, if the doctor tells you to do things like that, now you have a choice. Do those things or not do those things. I know some of the drugs they prescribe, I don't know that I'd want to take them either. But let's say that the drug which is prescribed it, it's not going to make you grow a third eye or a fourth nostril or some weird kind of stuff, all right? And so here you are, you're taking the medicine or you're going to therapy. What you need to be saying is this medicine is going to do what the doctor said it will do. Body, you are going to respond to this therapy. Do you understand what I'm saying? And along with that, you should be saying, and by the way, body, by Jesus stripes, you were healed. Are you, seeing, are you following what I'm saying? So to say anything other than that, you really don't have any reason to complain about what's going on in your body because you're the one that's enforcing it. You're actually taking a stand in opposite, in opposition rather, to God and his word. He wants you healed. Well, see, you've got a lot of Christians out there when they go through physical whatevers, well, God, he just teach me a lesson. No, what he's hoping is you're going to learn your lesson. He's not doing it. He wants you to get a hold of what he said in his word. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Speak life. Speak life. Turn over to Romans chapter 10. And I, I mentioned this briefly um, here before. But in Romans chapter 10, in verses 9 and 10. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now this word salvation, it comes from the Greek word soteria and it doesn't simply mean born again. Essentially, briefly, in short, it means everything that God has to offer you. Everything. So I confess Jesus Christ as Lord. I put my faith in him, I get born again. But it doesn't end there. My inheritance in Christ, everything that God has promised me, you know, I'll meet your need. And, I mean, you just go through scripture and you see all these things that God has promised. That is our salvation. So we confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
But are we confessing our salvation? Do you understand what I mean by that? Are we confessing that all my needs are met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? Are we confessing, God, <laughs> you didn't spare your own son, and so therefore you freely give me all things. Everything that I need, I have because of you. I know your grace, Jesus, that though you were rich, yet for my sake you became poor, that I through your poverty could be rich. You know, 2 Corinthians 8 9. Are we speaking, declaring, confessing our salvation, our inheritance? Because it doesn't just happen. You know, if you're an employer, you go to work and they give you a paycheck, all right? I know there's direct deposit nowadays, but they give you a paycheck. Now, you have that paycheck. <clears throat> How are you going to get that money into your bank? Don't you have to go to the bank, sign the check, and deposit it in the account? Okay, you have the paycheck. Look at that. I got my paycheck. You know, 50 bucks <laughs> or whatever you get paid. $500. There's my paycheck. Hallelujah. $500. This is great. What are you going to do with it? Well, I don't know, but praise God, I got my paycheck. I got my paycheck. And the bills are piling up. Well, why don't you pay it? Well, I got my paycheck. Yeah, well, we'll pay your bills with it. Well, how do you do that? See, I mean, that's just silly. You know what? Look here, this book. We got our paycheck. <laughs> We got our benefits. We got our salvation. It's right here. How do we deposit it? We speak it into our lives. We declare it into our lives. This is what God wants. It's how He operates. In Amos chapter three, verse three, it says, "Can two walk together except they be agreed?" So now here I am with God. And we're walking down the road. And uh, I start talking. Like, whoo-wee. Man, I'm telling you what, I'm so sick. Man, I'm telling you, I've never been so sick in all my life. I'm just sick. Boy, am I sick. Ooh, sick, sick, sick. And I'm telling you, and I hurt. Ooh, I hurt. Oh, man. And I'll tell you something else. God, where are you? <laughs> you know, he headed down a different direction. He says, I can't walk with you. We're not in agreement. I love you, but I can't be in agreement with this because that's not my word to you. I know what you're battling, but by my son's stripes, you were healed. If I'm not declaring God's truth over my life, my situation. I'm not in agreement with him. We'll never get these bills paid. Well, look, God's gone. <laughs> now, I know he doesn't leave you, okay? But you understand the concept. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? He can't walk in support of that. Because he said, I promised I would do this, and I promised I would... I'm, listen, I'm telling you right now, I truly believe... And one of the major reasons so many Christians are struggling is because of their mouth. They, they just refuse. And I mean refuse to speak in line with God's word. Because, see, your born-again spirit is going to bear witness with the word of God. And when you keep speaking all these things or in opposition to the word of God, your spirit is not even in agreement with that. But you're convincing yourself and your mind, your soulish person, if you will, your thinking, that that's the way it is. If you're a believer, you should be talking like you believe. And if you're not going to talk like you believe, then you, know, you can call yourself a Christian, but don't call yourself a believer because you really don't believe the word. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I'm a believer, but you don't talk like it. You, you, you talk defeat. Now, in, um, in Psalm 119, well, no, no, I, I want you to see this. Turn over to Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Now, this is a verse, you know, everybody can quote it, but I want you to see this. Hebrews 4, verse 12. 
For the Word of God, the Bible, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So now, here we have, let me say it like this, the anti-God confession wrapping itself around our born-again spirit. And it is producing a declaration that does not line up with the Word of God. It also becomes very irritated when confronted with this. Why do you keep talking that way? Hey, leave me alone, all right? And so what happens is the Word of God has to be introduced. Listen. Look at this. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of your non-transformed soul and your born-again spirit. In other words, if you don't start getting some word in you concerning what you speak, <laughs> what makes you think there's going to be any dividing asunder? You're born again, but your soul can still be dominating every aspect of your life and your confession. But you are born again. So now I take the Word of God and I begin to utilize it as a quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I begin cutting away that stuff of the soul, which does not line up with who I am in Christ. And it does not line up with my inheritance in Christ. Dividing asunder, soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word of God. Now, the more that we begin to feast on the word of God is the more that we're going to begin to change. It, I mean, how many of you know you can read the word of God but not receive it? This goes on all the time. Universities, your religion professors, they got the Bible. They read it. And uh, you know, one person was talking about being in school, university, and um, the professor had the Bible memorized. But he wasn't a Christian. But he had the Bible memorized, and he used it. He, he, could, he would quote Scripture to try and confuse and belittle Christians to prove how dumb they were because you don't know what you... You don't even know the Bible of the God you believe in. And he said this was extremely intimidating. Well, when you get into the Word of God to find out, okay, what have you said that I need to say? Then your confession can begin to change. By His stripes you were healed. Well, then I guess I should say that. I thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes I was healed. Hey, body, did you hear that? By Jesus' stripes you were healed. Don't you give me any more trouble. You hear me? Well, yeah, but Brother Martin, the doctor said, I, I know what the doctor said, praise God for doctors, but by Jesus' stripes, I was healed. You see, the primary purpose for confession, unlike what a lot of preachers have said, it is not to get stuff. Money, cars, houses, possessions. Oh, I know confessing about things like that, that yeah, plays a role. But the primary purpose for confession is to replace doubt with faith. It's to replace wrong imagery with correct imagery because your confession can create an image in your mind. It is to, to, to replace wrong understanding with right understanding. I am a new creature in Christ. I am not, you know, whatever you used to think about yourself. I am complete in Christ. I am not a loser. I am complete in Christ. I have the mind of Christ. God has given me a spirit of, you know, power, love, and a sound mind. Therefore, I'm not losing my mind. How many times have you been around Christians, they say that? Also, I just feel like I'm losing my mind. What a stupid thing to say. I mean, that's just a, a plain, dumb, stupid thing to say. 
I mean, that's just a plain old dumb, stupid, idiotic thing to say. Because <laughs> you don't want that, do you? You don't want to lose your mind. You don't want to be wandering the street and the police pick you up and, and you start reciting, you know, some children's story or something. You, you don't want this to happen. You don't want to be on the news, crazy woman arrested at six. You don't want to, you don't want that. You want a sound mind. Well, why would you say these other things? And I've been around people. Man, I'm telling you what. Let me tell you. The more that you get into this concept that I'm teaching is the more sensitive you're going to become to what people say. Christians especially. Lost people, what do you expect? But Christians especially. Like somebody says, oh, you know what? Man, I, where, where did I put my keys? And then the person next to him, a Christian says, oh, I know. I, I lose my keys all the time. Seriously, is that how you want to live? And the truth of the matter is, you probably don't lose your keys all the time. You're just saying that to fit into the moment. That's just plain ignorant. As one person said, that's ignorance gone to seed. <laughs> that's just not right. You shouldn't do that. Oh, Brother Martin, you know, you're, you're just grasping at straws. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. The, listen, there is a compounding effect on us through our confession. You know, a person says that, you know, oh, that's me too. I, you know, I can never, I, I always lose my keys too. Or somebody says, you know, well, my car is, oh yeah, you know, I know my car, it acts up, does the same thing. Does, and and we, we just keep saying these things to try to fit in, to try to be accepted, to try to be cool, to try to, you know, let that person know I can relate to you. Well, that's just like, you ever get these email notices from Facebook? Let so-and-so know you're thinking of him. It's like, but I'm not. <laughs> I wasn't until I saw this email. <laughs> and I don't want to think of them. <laughs> Delete. <laughs> this is critical. And I personally believe that the more that our confession lines up with with the opposite of what God has said, it begins to have a stressful effect on us because now you become like a house divided. God's life is in me, but my soul is trying to take control and I'm enforcing my soul over my spirit. In, uh, in this whole thing of the confession, it changes us, it doesn't change God. I am God, I never change. He said that in scripture, but it changes us. It changes us in what we believe and what we anticipate, expect. God's desires and his intents are already recorded in Scripture. It's here in the Word. So then our confession is a, is a repetition of his declared desires. See this? And so now I'm coming in line with him. I'm coming into agreement with him concerning what he has said about me. He wants his desires and his intents established in my life. Well, why wouldn't I? So therefore, I need to speak in line with what he has said. In my confession, the more that, that uh, I'm removing the wrong out of my life, out of my, my words, out of my confession, is the more that his life begins to come out. And I'll just tell you, you're going get, to get around some Christians if you start speaking the way God speaks, they're going to look at you like you're weird. <laughs> because they don't believe this. Well, okay. But I can prove that you do believe it. How are you going to prove that? How did you get born again? Well, I called upon the name of the Lord. Aha. So you do believe in confession. You just don't believe it enough. So... You telling me all that confession stuff doesn't work, but yet you are banking your eternity on what you said because you confessed Jesus. You better hope it worked. <laughs> so we create our own parameters for confession. <laughs> the truth is, we, could, we almost could use what you might call a confession boot camp. You know what? Boot camp in the army 
It's like, I don't know, 10 to 12 weeks of <laughs> you relinquish your life to somebody else. And they tell you when to get up, when to eat, when to, I mean, almost everything but when to go to the bathroom. Because, listen, even your bowels have more authority than your drill sergeant. <laughs> the drill sergeant, <laughs> the drill sergeant can say march, and your bowels can say, nope, it's time to go. <laughs> now, when you're in the military and you're going through boot camp, they tell you how to dress. They tell you what to wear. They tell you how to make your bed. They tell you how to eat. They, everything, all right? And what they're doing during that, that boot camp period is they are trying to completely remold you and make you into something you were not when you first got there. That's what confession is about. To create, I'm born again, but now I want to create a born-again lifestyle out of what I say. Now, the concept of a confession boot camp, I mean, that's just kind of weird. I didn't even know how you do something like that. But it, I shared that for, for just, you know, to create the image of, you know, every time you speak something wrong, drop and give me 50. <laughs> oh, it hurts. Drop and give me 50. Oh, I don't, I just, uh, you know what will happen pretty soon? You're going to put a, a guard on your mouth. Oh, I'm feeling so healed. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ooh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> now, you, I know you guys get, get the understanding here. But I think it would be a good idea if what I'm describing, you know, confession boot camp, if that hits home to every single person hearing this message, and every time you start to, you know, speak contrary to the word of God, immediately you start thinking, you know, drop and give me 50. It's like, oops, I better not say that. Uh-oh. Uh, and, and you'll start thinking about the word of God and what you should say. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of this and how it works. I'm going to give you three examples. Gary Carpenter, now what I'm going to share in these examples, these are things that have been shared publicly in sermons. Gary Carpenter was, uh, he was going through a rough time financially. You know, personally, ministry-wise, I mean, it was rough, really bad. You know, the bills were piled up, they're behind on almost everything. And he's praying, you know, God, what do I do, what do I do? Well, God directed him to three scriptures in the Bible, only three, three verses. Okay, three scriptures, that's it, three. And told him, confess. Now, these scriptures were, had to do with your finances. I think one of them was over there in Psalms where it talks about the young lions slack and do suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. All right, that, I think that was one of them. But nevertheless, um, he told Gary, you speak those three verses four hours a day. And he didn't really say for a week. He just said four hours a day. So, <laughs> you know, Gary's thinking, okay, I can do that. After about 10 minutes, <laughs> it's like, you got to be kidding me. I've already confessed them all, you know, 50,000 times in 10 minutes. Well, day after day after day after day. Day after day after day. And what was happening? Well, in Psalm 119, verse um, 130, it says, The entrance of thy words giveth light, and it giveth understanding to the simple. So what was happening is, he was introducing or entering into his, his spirit, his mind, the word of God concerning God's promises relative to finances. And this went on and on and on until finally it was like the word had divided asunder all that soulish, we ain't got nothing, away from the truth of they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. And there, I don't know how many days, how many weeks, how many months this went on, but one day it was like he had a glory explosion on the inside. And he went home and he walked in the house over to where they, they kept the bills and he grabbed those bills and he picked them up, you know, and it's like he put them on the table and he said, we do not live there anymore. 
And it was just a matter of days and all those bills were paid. Well, it hadn't been like that for who knows how long. But see, what happened, he kept confessing, kept confessing to where the confession went from just a confession of the words to a declaration of a belief and a lifestyle. Are you seeing the difference here? Confessing the word of God brings about a transformation on the inside concerning what we believe and how we trust God. Um, another situation, Pastor Dave Roberson was ministering down in Mexico. And, uh, you know, he was having a prayer line. And there was a man that brought his child up for prayer. Now, this um, the child, I'm going to say, was maybe two years old, maybe younger. But it, it had been born, I think it was a little boy. <clears throat> he had been born with his feet pointing the opposite direction. Instead of his feet pointing forward, they were pointing backward. Well, Pastor Dave, you know, prayed, and, and he told this guy, he said, you know, speak the word over your child. Speak the word over the, the feet and the healing and all that. And so Pastor Dave <coughs> was back there in that city ministering again about a year later. And this guy came up to him, and he says, look, 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 look. And there was that child a year older, but the feet were completely turned straight. And he said, this, it took, I think he said like eight or nine months of confession for this to happen. He said it wouldn't would have taken that long except at first, for the first month or two, I just didn't believe you. But then I decided, what do I have to lose? And so he began speaking. I don't know how, how much time every day he began speaking to his child's feet, speaking, confessing, declaring the word of God. And slowly but surely, those feet turned and became exactly what they were supposed to be. Now, I'm going to tell you another foot story. <laughs> and uh, this one, it's somebody that you know. And that's uh, Pastor Bronk Flint. Pastor Bronk Flint, um, he was having some problems with his feet. And he went to the doctor. I mean, there was a lot of pain. And he went to the doctor. And the doctor said, well, <laughs> for one thing, you don't have any arches. Your feet are as flat as flat can be, no arches. And for another thing, you have, and I'll read this to you, post-tibial tendon. Now, post-tibial tendon, look it up, not now, <laughs> wait till later. Post-tibial tendon is a, is a problem with a tendon, like in the foot, that enables movement. And uh, so, <laughs> Pastor Bronk, you know, he, he could barely... He could barely walk, and he couldn't run. And he asked the doctor, well, okay, how long is it going to be before I'll be able to, to run? And the doctor just kind of laughed and said, you're never going to be able to run. It's impossible. Not, you can't run. You have, I mean, the flat feet were bad enough, but this tendon problem, you can't run. There's no way. Never again in your life will you be able to run. Well, he told Bronk, you know, try to get some relief from the pain. You know, buy these arch insert things for your shoes. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's just the way it is. Well, <laughs> Bronk, he, he couldn't, I mean, he wasn't going to live with that. So he began speaking to his feet, declaring, confessing, talking to his feet, calling them healed. Look, guys, that's how serious... Uh, you got to talk to your body. Like Dr. Doolittle can talk to the animals. You can talk to your body, all right? Talk to your, is there something in your body that just isn't working right? Talk to it. Talk to it. You know, a lot of ladies have, you know, female things. Well, talk to it. Whatever it would be. Speak to your body. That's your body. That's your property. Now, Bronk began to confess, began to speak, began to declare. And in less than one year, his confession had produced arches in his feet. And this tendon problem was completely corrected. And now, all throughout the year, he'll run these five Ks. I mean, he's got ribbons. He's got all kinds of stuff, you know, from running the five Ks. T-shirts. <laughs> because he took the word of God and spoke it 
to his body because his body at that time was not in line with God's original plan for a human body. And so therefore he spoke, he spoke, he spoke, confessed, declared, declared and confessed. He said, I, I couldn't even walk around my block. I, I couldn't do that. He said the pain was just too incredible. I spoke to him right before service tonight to confirm this. But now, man, his, everything's fine. In less than one year, he, now listen, he changed his future by his confession. He refused to accept that minor level of being crippled. And he spoke to his body, and his body changed. Now see, I've given you three examples. And th these examples that I've given you have to do with, well, healing and then, um, you know, the the financial situation, but this works in anything. Anything that you see in the Word of God where there's something going on in your life, your body, whatever it would be, that is opposite of what is revealed in Scripture, okay, we now then have the mandate, the permission. We have the, the kingdom authority to take what we see in the kingdom book <clears throat> and speak it over that which isn't what the kingdom says it ought to be. And we can begin to see change. In Scripture, it tells us not to be weary in well-doing. Well, see, you confess for five minutes one day and nothing's changed. Well, don't give up. See, the Word of God can't fail. Keep speaking. It took Bronk less than a year. And it, it took this other man for his child's feet almost a year. And for Gary, I don't know for sure exactly how long. It was two years for Gary? Two years of confessing over his finances before that breakthrough came. I confess over the, the finances of this ministry. And it has, a, it, it has an impact. No, no. It has an impact. Because money comes in from places we don't even know people. <laughs> And the money comes in from them. And it's not like we send it back and say, well, we don't know you. So, no, we keep you know. <laughs> Money comes in. It comes in. You know, I confess, you know, I, you know, Father, I thank you so much that you're continuing to speak to people and organizations around the world and that finances are coming into this ministry like a massive nonstop tidal wave. I thank you that every deposit you know, it's just, it's just full. I thank you for the, the, uh, the, mir the million dollar, the, the gifts of millions. I thank you that you're touching the hearts of, of uh, millionaires and billionaires around the world, and they're giving into this ministry. I speak these things, not because I'm living in some kind of a fantasy world, but because I see a principle in the word of God that's true. And it has an impact. Listen, guys. <laughs> If this ministry had to exist on your paycheck, I don't know that it would work. So therefore, this confession isn't simply about the people here. I am confessing globally. <laughs> and it happens. And it works. This principle of speaking these things. What's going on in your life right now that, that doesn't line up with the Word of God? What's happening? Every one of you in here, what's happening? Well, you know, the doctor has me, you know, taking special kind of medications for a special condition. All right, then start talking to that condition. Just start talking to it. You know, uh, Gary Carpenter was taking medication for um, a heart problem. And uh, he began confessing, confessing and confessing concerning that. And the Lord told him one day, start taking just half that medication. Like instead of taking one pill, take a half a pill or whatever it was. So he did. Well, eventually over time, it got to where God said, don't take it anymore. He was completely healed. And he hasn't been taking that medicine ever since then. And the doctor said, you're going to be on it the rest of your life. Look, there are too many examples of this working. Now, you know, there could be folks listening to this and thinking, well, I, you know, well, thank you for the sermon, Brother Martin. 
but I just don't know if I believe all that. Then don't. It really, seriously, if you don't want to believe it, don't believe it. But it's still true. It still works. Now, there's some more about this that I want to share with you. Uh, we won't get into it tonight. But guard your words. Start being consciously aware of how you speak, especially if it concerns something in your life that does not line up with the Word of God. And speak what God would speak over you. Change will happen. Not necessarily tonight or tomorrow morning, but change will happen. Don't be weary in well-doing. You say, yeah, but the doctors say this is irreversible. You mean like with Pastor Bronk? He got arches and a healed tendon. Yeah. Yeah. Your words, your confessions have creative power. Because it's the word of God. Praise the Lord. Well, go ahead and stand. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word is true. It cannot fail. And I thank you, Father, that (coughs) the more we understand these things is the more we're going to see the victory you've given us manifest in our lives. Father, I thank you that no weapon formed against us can prosper, but yet we sometimes make our own tongue a prosperous weapon against us. So, Father, I say that will change. It will not be what it used to be, that we will speak what lines up with your word. And I thank you that you can't lie and your word is eternal truth. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. And I thank you again for sending your word and healing us and delivering us from all destruction. I thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes we were healed. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. Father, tonight as we leave, just ask you to watch over us and protect us. Remind us of these things. And Father... Encourage us day in and day out concerning our own testimony to ourselves. I praise you for this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Father, just keep working in us to prepare us for the, con- uh, the conference that's coming up so that we will be everything we need to be when the conference arrives and we'll be able to touch the lives of all the people who come in so that when they leave, they will be changed. Thank you, Father. Thank you again for tonight. We honor and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, if you have an offering tonight, please bring it up. You guys, whether you want to or not, I say, are going to have a good night the rest of this night. And you are going to sleep well. And you'll have wonderful dreams about me. Hallelujah. (laughs) Okay, maybe not. We'll see you again.